All right. I want this to move. Okay, I have to remember to point at the machine. Welcome to Create a Sustainable Yard. This is where I get to ask you to turn off your cellular devices and to remind you of the emergency exits. There's one on the north side, one on the south side. The bathrooms are right outside the door if you don't know. Um, and I'd like to thank the Keene Public Library for sponsoring this event. This is the first, first session in the 2022 Monadnock Sustainable Yard series. The event is being recorded, just for your information, and questions. Oh, hello, that's right. Oh my gosh. Oh, what a joy. Okay. <laughs> the event is being uh, recorded. Questions. If you could please hold your questions, we'll stop at a couple points throughout the presentation and then at the end as well. So I don't know about you, but everyday life is already pretty challenging right now. And this easy miracle of a magic hose is pretty appealing. Or maybe you're here because you felt like this, right? And it's almost spring again and time to start yet another season. Most of us would like to feel good about the time we spend on our home's landscape. Spring is a wonderful time, right? And many of you are here because you want a better landscape. And I'm here to share with you how your better landscape can actually help create a healthier community. So who am I? I am a lifetime gardener, and I have to say who was a very unhappy traditional professional landscape architect for many years. I'm an environmentalist, I'm a mom. I have a bachelor's in landscape architecture and master's in natural resource management. And I'm also the owner of Healthy Home Habitats a local environmentally friendly landscape design and coaching company based right here in Keene. So back to the other reasons you might also be here. There are days when many of us might wish that a blowtorch could be our only yard tool because our yards feel like they need too much mowing, too much weeding, it's frustrating and expensive to replace dead plants after you've already spent the time and energy to put them in the ground. It's also time consuming and expensive to buy and plant flowers every year. But as you know, there are much bigger challenges going on in the world right now. Increased stops, storms, fires, floods, deforestation, pollution, water scarcity, loss of biodiversity, biodiversity and soil erosion. And we can notice some of these larger challenges every day closer to home. You may have noticed in your backyard, our bird population has dropped dramatically by 3 billion birds since 1970 across the nation. Billion with a B, that's one in four birds, no longer here. John Fitzpatrick, Fitzpatrick, executive director of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology tells us lawn chemicals we know are responsible for reducing the survival of birds. Pesticides are a large part of the problem, says Fitzpatrick. He also states a surprising number and variety of North American wildlife species in general are quietly disappearing. And then he states the good news. It's thousands of people making little bits of difference that will actually help. So what about right here in New Hampshire? Kirk Dorsey, an environmental historian for UNH says, we know that we're hemorrhaging species, not just losing a few. And more importantly, we're hemorrhaging habitat. So if you are here to learn how to save time, money, and energy, that's how it was built, and hoping that magically this will make your yard more sustainable, I've got some great news. <laughs> the larger issues and how we manage our yard are interrelated. 40 million acres interrelated. That's a lot of land that's owned by private property owners. 130 million residential properties. We get to choose what happens on that land. A double benefit of less time, money, and resources and health is indeed possible with a shift 
in what we think is a desirable landscape. It's what I call a twofer. And I really love twofers. You might too. If every homeowner everywhere decides to change part of their management, we can improve these dire environmental circumstances. This won't change the biggest issues, but it will improve the health of our communities, both human and wildlife. Habitat, so wildlife and creating habitat. Wildlife and all the components of our natural world need safe, healthy places to live, just like we do but we call theirs habitat. So what's habitat? Well, habitat is not only the wildlife preserve somewhere in your community. Habitat is any place that provides the combination of food, water, and shelter, just like your home for you, right? As it's arranged to meet the needs of wildlife, really any non-human life and all the creatures who are also trying to live here with us, our backyards, and our front yards can become small habitats. And even becoming a partial small habitat will be progress. We can provide food, water, habitat in our yards in ways that almost magically by their nature, and we'll talk about how, still help us reduce cost, time, and resources. Truly, I'm not joking. So let's take a look at those pieces of habitat. First, water. Now, I'm not advocating for ponds or fountains. We're trying to do less maintenance, not more, right? But providing water for wildlife habitats can be as simple as adding plants that have evolved in ways that provide water. A shrub's berries, you can see on the left here, can hold and do hold drops of water during rain or mist that are then available to wildlife, pollinators, and birds. The native cup plant on the right, where the arrow is, you can see it has a square stem, and that's because it's in the mint family. But where the leaves join that stem, it actually creates a little cup. And that cup holds water during a rain event and holds that water for a longer period for other creatures to be able to have access. Some folks have even created rain gardens in their yards, and that those hold water for a short period of time, making it available to wildlife as well. So shelter. Shelter for needed habitat or for habitat can be provided for wildlife in our yards by using leaf mulch. We'll talk about that later. By planting shrubs, shelter for wildlife habitat in our yards can be a pile of dead wood, which you might already have in the back of your yard where animals can den instead of under your porch. Toads, you can see on the right here, who eat mosquito larvae, we like that, right? Can hide in and amongst ground cover plants. You can see here, we have lungwort, the spotted leaves. We have bloodroot, which is a native. And we have, uh, we have our creeping Charlie, we probably have people who are familiar with creeping Charlie. And birds can hide in the shrubs. You can see on the left here, that can be their shelter to eat their berries and for their nests. Food. Appropriate food for wildlife can be provided for in many ways, beyond just the bird feeders in our yards. Goldenrod on the left here, often mistaken for ragweed, not ragweed, is a particularly powerful, what we call a powerhouse plant. It's described by Douglas Tallamy. He's coined this firm. He's an entomologist and the author of many books, but in particular, Nature's Best Hope. Goldenrod is one of the last plants in our season that provides abundant pollen and nectar to the pollinators who are just before they hibernate for the winter or go to um, create eggs for next year. And the one on the right, you know this one, blueberries. They provide food not only for wildlife, but for us too, right? It's a native plant, provides nectar and pollen in the spring with their flowers. And I use blueberry plants quite frequently in my designs for its fruit, its hardiness because it's native to here and it's fabulous scarlet fall color. Who wouldn't want that plant? So I propose to you that these example front and backyards, even in an urban setting, are small habitats for many species of wildlife, maybe the smaller ones, insects, birds, all kinds of pollinators. And they do that by providing appropriate food, shelter, and water. These in particular are a mix of native native vars, which are the natives that are bred for the prettier aspects, right? And non-native plants. They're not prairies, they're not native meadows, 
but they're not toxic either. And here's the best part. Here's where the twofer comes in. These small habitats and pollinator patches don't require mowing, fertilizing, or watering after they're established. They don't even require very much weeding because we're using ground cover to prevent the sun from accessing those weed seeds. You know what they do require? Leaf mulch. We're gonna talk about that later. And these same spaces, no matter how small, combine and link together, adding more pieces back to habitat corridors, slowly reconnecting, even if still disjointed and interrupted right now, places for all other lives in our ecosystem once again to flourish with their families. And as we're learning in a broader world by a very hard lesson, healthier ecosystems mean healthier humans. But wait, you say, I'm kind of fine with my lawn, my two pink bushes, it's doing good. Why is regular landscaping bad? Why is it so bad? Because now we know. We get a little distracted in our busy lives, but science can now quantify, and the numbers are overwhelming. Regular landscaping is how most of us, and we're going to use that term today, is how most of us currently manage our landscapes. It increases air pollution, it increases water pollution, it causes soil contamination, it causes more noise pollution, it's linked to increased dog cancers, and it's linked to the dramatic and catastrophic pollinator declines that you've heard about. So let's look at these one by one. First, regular landscaping creates air pollution. You can see a gas powered motor on the left and I've never seen one of these. It looks like a solar powered motor. Has anybody tried one? No, it looks cool. On the average, running a gas powered mower for one hour produces as much pollution as driving for how many miles? Anybody have a guess? How many miles? One hour, as much driving, how many miles? 100 miles, 650. And if you're not convinced, let's try another one. <clears throat> hour for hour, gasoline powered lawnmowers, not sure what that's about, produce how many times pollution as a new car per hour per hour? One times, two times, any guesses? Okay, I won't shame you. Huh? 50, okay, this one's better, 11 times. <laughs> Whew, gosh, I hate to be always a bear of badges. And gas powered leaf blowers emit nearly 300 times the amount of air pollutants as a pickup truck running for the same period. 300 times as a pickup truck. That's not good news. Regular landscaping creates more water pollution, primarily from fertilizer runoff. We use these fertilizers to make our lawns lush, to make our plants bloom more, but we use on average almost 10 times the amount that we actually need. And no matter how we try, the excess runs off into our lakes and ponds streams and causes that green harmful algae that you see the signs for. These have the ability to poison our fish. They're compromising our aquatic ecosystems, our children, and you know, our pets. What's going on with the feed here? Huh, don't know. It's not me, I swear. Regular landscaping contaminates our soil. 17 million of the 600 million gallons of fuel we use for gas powered landscape equipment nationwide ends up on the grounds from spills contaminating our soils. These are the little spills at the gas station when you're trying to get it into your can and at home when you're trying to get it into the gas uh, to get into power, the mower tank. That soil contamination is a problem. Regular landscaping creates more noise pollution. I don't think this one's a surprise. If you can't, can you, can you read the text here? It's, it's your only day to sleep in here. Let me play you the song of my people, All right? We've got the mower up on top. We've got the hedge trimmer and the uh, edger down below. Gas powered lawnmowers range from 82 to 90 decibels. 
gas powered leaf blowers are just as loud, but they have the added benefit of spraying animal droppings, chemicals, dirt, dust, mold, and pollen into the air. In fact, more than 100 cities have outlawed gas powered leaf blowers. Dallas, Portland, Washington, DC has a $500 ticket if you decide to violate that ordinance. Weed whackers make a whopping 96 decimals of noise, decibels of noise, and you can tell we're going up. And hedge trimmers are a, a even louder, 103 decibels. Now, not only is this noise irritating and disruptive, but anything above 85 decibels actually has the ability to cause irreparable harm to an adult's hearing after extended or repeated exposure, let alone a child. Regular landscaping is linked to increased dog cancers because we treat the grass they play in, they roll in, they rest in. The most common herbicide in many of the products we buy at the garden centers have been linked to canine malignant lymphoma. A study found that four applications a season raised the risk of cancer to twice that of dogs who lived in yards without these treatments. Just a reminder, just because a product is sold in the store doesn't mean that it is safe or not poison for something. And lastly, regular landscaping is strongly linked to the drastic decline of both pollinators and birds. You've been hearing about this for a while, right? At this point, both there are scientists who feel both our native and honeybees are on the brink of total collapse. And you can see the image on the left here, Scientists, whoever, found 36 different pesticides, including DDT, in dead bird nests. Jeez. Why did the birds put all those pesticides in their nests? Yeah, you may know why. We fed the caterpillars the systemic insecticides that we put on our plants to have those perfect leaves and those big flowers. And the birds took those poisoned caterpillars and brought them to their babies who died. We poisoned the babies over and over again with new families. So, whew. okay, we're done with the nasty facts of traditional or regular landscaping. You know, the one that requires all the mowing, fertilizing and replanting. Can I ask, are there any questions about these bad parts of traditional landscaping? Because now we're getting to the good parts. Any questions? Did I miss one that bothers you? No? Oh, yes. You know, I am not a scientist and I'm gonna guess, we do have one in the, in the room. Do you know the answer to that? It's nationwide. Is it still in the soil, so? I does persist. Yeah, sure. yeah, so, and, and does that, a little bit? Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's in the nest. Anybody else? Okay, all right, let's get to the good stuff. So, right, right, Michelle, but I'm going home this afternoon to a regular old landscape. How do I get from point A to point B? You can see the lawn on the left on a slope. Boy, aren't they fun to mow. And this particular owner decided to get rid of, rid of a little bit of that grass, decrease the amount that they were doing, and then eventually stepped their way towards a landscape with ground cover, a variety of different types of perennials and shrubs. So those perennials have flower, for a persistent number of years. They don't have to be replanted. You can see the variety of textures and colors that happen throughout the season. The hostas go a beautiful gold in the fall. In the back, there are shrubs that have a nice scarlet feathery uh, effect. And there's no mowing happening here. There's no weeding happening. Well, no, once a month, there's weeding happening here, particularly in the ground cover area in front. But there's no watering and there are no pesticides or herbicides. So you came here for steps to a sustainable land, a sustainable yard. And we're gonna go through buy less landscape stuff, cycle food at home, use less chemicals, have less lawn and grow more native plants. 
These steps are still obviously optional that I just lifted off listed off but if even if you only do one you are still reducing the current damage that's happening now your piece of more color more texture and more diversity is valuable because it will help to rebalance these ecosystems protect watersheds mitigate the amount of runoff that we have of soil into our waters and provide shelter for the rest of our wildlife each of these steps can be taken over time and guess what Remember the 40 million acres? That's a lot of land. We have the ability to actually make a difference, at least in our communities. So number one, buy less landscape stuff. This is where it all happens, right? It's like a kid in a candy store. American gardeners spend $48 billion on lawns and gardens in 2018, because it takes the national government a long time to compile these numbers, right? 2020 may have been the year of our homes because we were stuck there. 2021 was when we started saying, geez, I'm going outside and taking a look at our yard. I don't even have a number for how much was spent there. But this is where we buy annual flowers, perennial flowers too, shrubs and trees, mulch, water, fertilizers, pesticides, and all the hardscape elements that, that we use. So, First, annual flowers. They require money, time, and they contribute to the plastic problems that we've got in our country that then eventually affect the rest of the world. In the UK, they actually outlawed replacing annual, the, um, annual gardens in public gardens and um, I guess it's public gardens because of the excessive costs. They said, no, 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 we're not doing that every year now. It's expensive. We have the choice to use native perennials instead. We'll take a look at what some of those look like. They provide food and habitat for wildlife. They have extensive root systems that hold soil, provide for infiltration, slowing rain runoff, which we know is a challenge, at least here in Keene, and they benefit the pollinators. Those perennial flowers provide the flowers for many years, don't have to be replanted. You can see on the left here, the rooting depth of some of the non-natives, most, many of us have spirea in our yard, daylilies, fountain grass, fescue turf, they go down, you know, three inches to 12 inches. They don't know any better, right? The natives are on the right, they're smarter. They have evolved through time to be able to go through dry periods. Their roots can go down deep. We're looking at eight, I know it's a very light slide, I'm sorry, eight foot, 14 foot for a common nine bark that I used in a design just a year and a half ago. I, I know this because when I'm helping people move plants around and they happen to be natives, they're a lot more challenging than that day lily. So it's the same with the trees and the shrubs. We have the option to buy them as native plants too, reducing the amount of time and money for fertilizers and the number of them that need to be replaced after a season of our regular weather. This is an example of a restored native residential landscape in Nebraska, created by author Benjamin Vogt, who now has a company called Monarch Gardens, and it is completely a habitat. And it gives us an example to talk about what native plants do. We've talked about what they don't. They, and this, has a rich and diverse variety of plants. And it provides, and I'll grant you, it took several years to establish this. This didn't happen by magic and it doesn't come out where you can roll it down to the ground yet. Um, but it's in the middle of a regular subdivision, right? This particular fellow has decided that this is what he's chosen to do. And I'm still looking for a slide because I know I've seen one with the regular grass. Actually, we have a close one later on. I find it heartbreaking to see monarch butterflies flying around in my, yard looking for their only food source milkweed after they've finished blooming i don't know if you've noticed this too this yard grows fruit nectar and seeds from native plants for our creatures and insects at the time that they're ready to use them these native plants begin to restore the plant and animal relationships at each of these sites to help repopulate our ecosystems to not only survive, but thrive. So the next one, 
buy less mulch. Anybody want to guess how much we spend on mulch each year? It's almost a billion dollars. <laughs> mostly bark mulch, which is mostly carbon, no nutrients involved. Unfortunately, you may or may not know that we don't have that many trees losing their bark. The mulch can contain preservatives and other contaminants because a lot of this bark mulch is ground down from pallets, pallets that we use to ship things around the nation, which have been treated to slow down their decom decomposition. So, and painted, right? Because we don't want it to look like pallets. So we paint it to make sure it looks like this. And I'm gonna say, Instead, how about using your free fall leaves for mulch? Farmer's Almanac says that leaves are actually fall's most abundant crop. And they estimate, oh, come on, there we go. They estimate that just one large tree holds $50 worth of plant food and hummus, hummus, <laughs> not hummus. You can continue to give your leaves away every year. I find it a lot of work to rake them down to the curb. Or you can keep what you already own and try a different way, buy less mulch. Leaves are a tree's cycled nutrients, AKA fertilizers. I would humbly suggest saving your time and money using what you already own. I mow my leaves, some are in the yard, I mow them out on the driveway and on the sidewalk because it shreds it down. It is so much easier to move around. And you can see in the top part of the slide here, it's beautiful mulch. There are no plastic bags, no lugging those plastic bags from the garden center into your car, out of your car, to the place you need it in your yard, or shoveling wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow what you have delivered to your house in a big pile on the, you know, it's already there. <clears throat> the fifth item, buy less water. Is that the fifth one? Well, yes, oh, we're still on the materials. Many perennials and all native plants need less watering. Ground cover plants conserve moisture. Less watering is because of the deeper roots. Leaf mulch that I'm proposing you use reduces the evaporation even more. Having less grass. Lawn watering accounts for 30% of all the water used during the summer. In the east, it's 60% in the west. It's a lot of water that we've already paid to have purified for those of us who are not on a well. Lawns use, are you ready? Nine billion gallons of water per day nationwide. I advocate for buried soaker hoses with timers that save water when you really have a place that needs it. Rain barrels, you can see on the left here, are also a great way when you have the circumstances to not use this drinking water on our landscapes. You can see the US EPA estimates that when we use that water, we waste as much as 50% because we put the hose in the wrong place and we walk away, or we put the hose in the right place and we walk away, or we set the, the sprinkler and part of it's going on the driveway. 50% is a lot of water. It'd be nice to buy less water. We're on to the next one, cycle food at home. Americans currently send 90% of our food waste to landfills. That's no big surprise. Vermont, they have outlawed putting food waste in the landfills, you probably know. Are they doing that just to make Vermonters absolutely insane? Because, you know, no. Who wants a new landfill in their community? Our landfills are already at the point where we are really worried. We have the ability to do this in two different ways. Composting. Composting can be challenging, right? But there are lots of different ways to do this. There are many options. There are all kinds of gadgets now that you can have in your house. And there are all kinds of gadgets that you can have outside of your house. And if you really can't stand it, we have a fabulous local company right here in Keene called Elm City Compost who will come to your driveway and pick up that bucket for you every week. Yeah, I think it's weekly during the season. And I propose that we can grow some of our own food. 
my own opinion is strategically. Many of us, I'm gonna hesitate to say, most of us do not have the time or energy to manage an entire vegetable garden on the ground. I advocate and I work with clients to do vining vegetables in containers on lattices. It's pretty fascinating. That's a, a cucumber there hanging from the fence. Oh, and you can see my daughter in the middle, all fascinated with growing her little watermelon. And I use it with my clients or suggest to them what I call thigh high beds. I'm tired of getting up and down on the ground. But vining vegetables have a much higher success rate. It's nice to grow something and actually feel successful about it. And they can happen not only in the pots, but along fences as well. You've probably seen fences where they're growing grapes. It's a fabulous way to do it in full sun. This growing just some of your food saves untold miles of tractor trailers moving food back and forth from one coast to the other, let alone the water and resources and chemicals where much of it is grown. All right, so we finished the first two steps of sustainable landscape. Buy landscapes, buy less landscape stuff and cycle food at home. Questions? I wanna make sure, yeah, okay. Char? So that's an issue of timing and how, in what period of time you'd like to use those leaves. So I mow them because I want them to break down and release those, for those nutrients sooner. But if you're leaving them in the back of the yard, nobody says you have to mow them. It's just going to take longer for them to break down. I, I had a great little video that showed all the insects breaking down leaves into wonderful soil. So it's an issue of time. Does that answer? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Okay. All right. So that question was, do you have to mow the Can you, uh, do you have to mow the leaves that you're going to put in a pile to let break down? And my question, my answer was, it has to do with the timing. If you want it to break down sooner, mow them. If you don't leave it in the back of the yard. Yes, so I'm thinking you mow. Yeah. yes, because she's trying to avoid using a mower. Absolutely. You do not have to mow them. I do it. The catch is um, for the gardens that I have and the clients that I have that bulbs sometimes, um, so leaves have different qualities, right? Maple leaves break down much more quickly than oak leaves. Oak leaves have more lignans, more tannins. Um, so, and leaves can, depending upon how much you pile on, mat down on one another and make it harder for the perennials and the ground covers to come up. So that's the reason why I do it. It certainly doesn't happen in the forest and things do fine there, but we like to have our impact be bold and strong. So um, it depends on the leaves and it depends on how many you have. It particularly bothers me. I tried it one year, I was getting leaves from other people's yards and dumping them on mine. Um, my bulbs had a hard time punching up. So. So the question was, do you have to, can you throw whole leaves on your gardens? Yes, you can, but you run the risk, depending upon the leaf, of retarding, slowing down the plants coming through. I have done that once and I didn't have time. I just all the leaves just put them all on there and then it's spring. I just made sure to move them off a little bit so that things aren't. Ah, so. Like loosen it up. Yeah. Yep. That's a possibility. So we have a, a, a person in the in the audience here who did just pile all those leaves for to save time on, in their garden areas. And in the spring, took the time to loosen those up a little bit, which is a great option. I should remember that option myself. Yes, sir. Are you going to address uh, sources of local plants? And how you go when you go to buy something that's local or not? Ooh, so that's a great question. I have, I will suggest a fabulous local grower who grows native plants from seeds, um, which I can tell you is Nasami. Nasami, N-A-S-A-M-I, is a, in Waitley, Massachusetts, is the grower for the Native Plant Trust. And they grow plants from seeds and they provide native plants. Uh, they provide a lot of little plants. They'll provide plugs. They also provide some larger plants and it's a great place to go experiment. Other places will carry native plants and that's a really challenging subject um, because growers use these herbicides and pesticides to make the beautiful plants that we're willing to spend monies for, right? Home Depot, 
uh, Lowe's had made a commitment a couple years ago that within a certain number of years, they would require that their suppliers no longer use those. I tried to do some research for this presentation to hear how that was going, and I haven't heard anything. So I know I ask, it doesn't make me the most popular customer, you know, Agway, do your people use this stuff? One time they gave me the number of that person. And if I'm not mistaken, that person didn't, but they get lots of trucks. It's really challenging. Who wants to poison the pollinator you just made the garden for because you bought that pollinator plant at a place that happens to have a grower who used it? Um, and just, we're going to, just say it now, if you have that circumstance and if you want to play it safe, pinch off those blooms for the first season. Oh, painful. <laughs> but then you don't run the risk because they will work themselves out, but it takes time. Any other questions? Did you have some oh, good. Okay. Um, so one person would like to know what kind of mower you use to mow your weeds. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. All the guidance online says you need a mulch mower. Um, the mower that you saw, that green mower, or the green mower bag, it's a plastic, is a little bitty tiny electric mower with a cord. Oh my God, that cord's a pain. Um, it, it, you have to be reasonable, right? So with that electric mower, I can mow leaves, I'd say up to my mid shin. Kind of back up and go forward, back up and go forward. But to my experience, it does not take a fancy mower to do this, or one with a big engine. Now, granted, I'm mowing dry leaves. I'm not trying to mow a pile of wet leaves that has, you know, is solid. So that would be my answer. Um, someone else would like to know if you have ideas for protecting compost from critters or rodents. So the easiest way to do that is, and Catherine could tell us this too, don't put meat or cheese products or bones in there. Those are what are going to attract, or dairy, right? That's what attracts the, the rodents, the bigger creatures. We want the little creatures. The little creatures are in there breaking down those leaves into soil. So we want those guys. Ah, that, that is the other advantage of mowing the leaves because it breaks it down to those smaller pieces. So there's less surface area for those, wind, for those leaves to be blown. Um, and really that's the only solution that, that I would propose for that. Is there an ideal time to keep um, the leaves in a pile before you use them as mulch? Like maybe to break them down? So if you pile the leaves up in a big pile in the back corner of the garden or yard, depending upon how much water it gets from the rain, you know, how much exposure it has, determines how long it's going to take to break down. So it's really an issue of the time it takes to break down. I'm going to tell you that a big pile of leaves, especially if it's in some chicken wire, is going to take two to three years to break down especially if it has a lot of oak leaves. If it's all maple leaves, then, you know, less time. But it's all an issue of how quickly you would like to use it for which purpose. Yes. So the question is, is there a place where you can buy leaf compost? I have not heard of a place that offers leaf compost. There are lots of places that will offer compost. And to be honest, that's one of my issues with buying compost is what's in it, right? Um, does, has anybody else heard of a place to buy leaf compost? Okay, so I'm sorry, I don't know that one. Oh, hello, residents of Keene, go up to the dump. It's great. And, and right now, if you go up there, you can watch it steam. You know, in the years past, they weren't turning it as frequently and I used it once and there were weed seeds in there, you know? So last year I specifically went out there a couple times during the winter, saw it really steaming. I used that mulch all season long. I used it with clients and it's free. Now, granted, it's another trip back and forth, but you're not paying anything if you're a resident of Keene or you hire somebody who is. So I completely forgot. Thank you for reminding me. Let's take um, one more, and then I, we should probably keep going so we don't run over. I just want to clarify, so you go to the dump and get compost? Yeah, absolutely. You, you fill up and take it. 
you go to the top of the hill all the way past the electric stuff it's a big pile and and right now it's steaming i will say that they um it, the ground gets wet and so they put down their recycled glass bits uh, so um, I've never had a tire pop, but you'll see it on the ground. I just back my car up. If I'm really feeling adventurous, I line the back of it with plastic and shovel it in as the back of my car. The truck would be best, but I've used plastic bags. I've used buckets um, and you can come back as many times as you want. It's, a, it's really a blessing that they're using our tax dollars for the people who don't want their leaves to make it a resource for the rest of us. Okay, we're gonna move on just because I, I had tried to time the shy to 40 minutes, but um, we're going to try to be careful. Okay, so uh, which is this? Number three of creating a sustainable yard, use less chemicals. You probably saw this coming. Herbicides kill plants, which we call weeds, in a place where we don't want them. Pesticides kill what we call pests or bugs, which are insects, which birds need. As you can see, nationally, we use almost a billion pounds of conventional pesticides and herbicides each year. As I mentioned earlier, we don't need to use this much, but we use this 10 times the amount of what we, what's actually needed because we don't follow the instructions on the bag. You know, maybe a little bit better is, a little bit more is better than less. It's, it's really just a choice on our part. Now, sadly, sometimes the problems of using landscape chemicals are obvious. This poor sucker happened to put herbicide in their fertilizer instead of the fertilizer or the gadget. Um, and it's straightforward. So this is really straightforward, but the other aspect is not so straightforward. Chip Taylor, the director of the Monarch Watch at the University of Kansas, it's coming. It doesn't take much, two or three bites and they're dead. He says that milkweed plants that are treated with the insecticides called neonicotinoids that make our plants beautiful kill caterpillars because these chemicals are systemic. They go through the plant, so they're really effective, but they're also effective that when the caterpillars eat the treated leaves, they either fall off the plant or the bird comes, gets that poisoned caterpillar and brings it to their nest. I didn't know, literally really until this past year, a mama songbird needs how many caterpillars to feed one clutch of, of birds, of baby birds? Any ideas? They take the caterpillars because they're packed with uh, protein and nutrients. How many caterpillars for one clutch? 2,000, 6,000. One bird, one nest, 6,000 caterpillars to feed one nest. If these caterpillars are poisoned, those babies die. He says that they have to warn people, as we've already talked about, so we won't go over that, of buying plants from big box stores that are treated with the neonicotinoids. It's not like you can see them, right? You can't see those poisons, but come on, could we share some of our leaves with these creatures that, that we like to see in our world? Is it Granted, our leaves will be more holy, but okay. Step four of creating a sustainable yard, have less lawn. I would propose that we brought this landscape ethic aesthetic with us. It's not actually American. We brought it from Europe, right? Currently turf grasses occupy 2% of the surface of the continental United States, 2%. That's a huge amount of land. It's the largest irrigated crop in the country more than corn. 20% of the land cover of Massachusetts and New Jersey is covered in grass. It's a lot of grass. If you should decide to have less grass, you want to talk about a two fur, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fur. You use less pesticides, you use less fossil fuels, you cause less water pollution, you spend less money, you cause less habitat loss, and you potentially have better health for all of those reasons. But we like our lawns. So how about Thomas Rayner and Claudia West suggested in their book, Planting in a Post-Wild World, think of lawn as a rug, not a wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Or as my daughter pointed out to me this week, mom, you frame grass with plants. You could consider surrounding your center area of grass 
with plantings, which results in less turf with a beautiful, colorful, healthy frame around it. And lastly, if you really got to keep it, a recent study by the US Forest Service found that being a lazy lawnmower, Catherine, once again, has ecological benefits. Mowing every two weeks is optimum for allowing access to blooms, the little blooms for the little clovers and the other little plants, because we got a lot of other plants in our grass, right? Our sandy soil. The greatest number and variety of bees are able to access those little flowers every two weeks. If you mow it every three weeks, that'll do too, but the grass is taller and less of the tinier native bees. Our native bees are smaller than honeybees. They're prevented access by those taller grasses. So two weeks, every mowing every two weeks is really the sweet spot. And a last word about the easiest way to support pollinators with a plant that likes to be in our lawns. Dandelions are not native, but they are in the sunflower family. Dandelions, I would propose, are the unsung heroes for pollinators because dandelions provide a completely free source of pollinated, pollen and nectar, the two main things bees need to survive. One cup of dandelion greens, we knew this long ago, the entire plant is edible, but one cup provides 112% of vitamin A and 535% of vitamin K, you know that one that's really hard to get a hold of? You can find dandelion leaves in the green grocers now. I know we have it at the co-op. And up until the 1800s, dandelions were valued. People removed grass to plant them. So, you know, hey, because really, aren't there other things we'd like to be doing than taking care of grass? All right, grow more native plants. Lastly, step five, it's true. The more glamorous native ours, their brighter colors are a step in the right direction, but they don't have the same benefits. True native plants that are grown by seed have the genetic variations that allow for more health. And once again, so here's the Nasami Nursery in Waitley, Massachusetts. Growers for the Native Plant Trust in Massachusetts are most helpful to our wildlife and ecosystems. Native plants supply food, wildlife food, in the form of appropriate nuts, fruits, and seeds. This helps, even if they're small spaces. It supplies water and with the low wet spots or the drops on the plants, which help. Native plants supply that cover and shelter with their ground covers, their perennials, and their shrubs. Every little bit helps. And I would say, come join the fun, right? You provide these things in your particular yard, you can become a certified wildlife habitat. That's kind of cool. You can put a sign up in your yard and join the people throughout the nation who are doing this or have even more fun. You can get on the map. That Douglas Tallamy, the uh, entomologist, is a co-founder of what's called the Homegrown National Park. And it is a collection of people like you and me who are adding our little pieces of land with at least a native plant and maybe a lot of them to a map to begin to be able to see how these pieces can be connected and are connected by the creatures who are trying to live there throughout our entire nation, right? <laughs> That's fun. So what else? We talked about buy less landscape stuff, cycle food at home, use less chemicals, have less lawn, grow more plants, the five steps for a more sustainable yard. But what have you experienced already that reduces your impact or helps you save resources? May I ask? I do this for a living, but I am not perfect. And I'm sure there's something I'm missing and I wanna know. Anybody, anybody online? their mowing. Oh, that's fabulous. Not only do they do mowing, but they leave their fertilizer too, which is fabulous. That uh, boy, that would be my choice. And then, you know, cause people have large pieces of land. No questions. Okay. All right. Um, so these are yards before regular urban lots, right? I'm going to read your quote from Sarah Stein, author of Noah's garden. We cannot 
in fairness, rail against those who destroy the rainforest or threaten the spotted owl when we have made our own yards uninhabitable. These spaces have few species. In most cases, if it looks like this, you've got poisoned caterpillars, which mean poisoned birds and pollinators. We've got fertilizer that's inevitably going to run off into our lake streams. And there's lots of mowing, lots of watering, and lots of weeding. And if we want to make it even more stark, here is that parcel in the regular subdivision. Only a handful of species, all those things, and down below, a diverse mix of species of plants mowing one time of year. It's March after the everybody's had their chance to eat what's there. No watering, no fertilizer, no pesticides. Too much? You don't want this in your yard? I get it. I get it. Well, come on. These are those same yards after. There's steps in a healthy direction. It doesn't happen by magic, but I'll read you another quote. This by this Douglas Talami. Each of us can choose to take conservation into our own hands by questioning the culture of lush green lawn and instead committing to plant half of our yards and landscape with native and especially those keystone plants. He's actually the co-founder co of the, or maybe I mentioned that already, the America's Homegrown National Park. Remember those 130 million residential lots planting a little bit of ecosystem sustaining species in each one of those yards? We create dynamic habitats for beneficial insects, pollinating birds and bees. So just to recap, benefits of a sustainable landscape. Less mowing seems to me more time for other parts of life. Less time spent watering. That makes me a happy homeowner. I don't know about you. Increased plant diversity, more habitat for our wildlife partners and more balance in our ecosystem. I had one more, yeah. Reduced toxic chemical exposure, better health for everyone. And to me, that means a little bit more peace. And as well, steps to a sustainable yard. I would propose that it's possible to do both to save time, to save money and resources over time while causing less damage and creating more health. What's needed is your willingness to shift your opinion from what is pretty and desirable to maybe what brings and sustains life with beauty in a whole different way for the entire season of seasonal change. You can protect the three things that matter at most and matter most to people at home your family, your wallet, and your landscape, while helping your community and our ecosystems at the same time. I thank you for your time today. I would love to help you take any of these steps at your home. I would love even more to coach you on how you can take them yourselves. I have um, postcards here for five workshops, hands-on workshops here in Keene that will happen through the spring, throughout the summer, that will take a closer look on these issues of a sustainable yard. Um, the titles are here, More Pleasureless Pain, Easy and Fun Home Harvest with Vining Vegetables, Supercharging Your Yard Soil, Creating Your Own Pollinator Patch, because it's not brain surgery, you don't necessarily need me, Catching the Rain, Options for Your Yard. So, we're all done. What questions can I answer? Catherine. I have a question, but um, the one place I found for data perennials is going to tell us after. It's going to be everything. Um, so useful. Um, it's bag and pond perennials. It's warmer. So they're really good. They don't just have to crumble. Great. Totally organic. They ship. Bagley ponds in Warner. Yeah. Uh, North Creek Nurseries, if you can talk to somebody like me and they can order them, they don't ship to the public, but they all as well will ship you. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are uh, national places that will ship from predominantly the Midwest and then down in, um, down a little bit south of us too, that will ship you entire flats of the plugs, which is a great way to go because they're less expensive. Thank you, Kat. So Warner, yes. Warner Mass Bagley. Ecotypes, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so bag, pond, perennial. Terrific. 
You know, yeah, oh, I don't know whether it attracts. It is an animal product. So right. my instinct would be, I put them in mine, um, and, but they take forever to break down. So people grind theirs. I actually toasted a grinder once trying to do that. Um, so <laughs> the dust. Um, so I think that's a, a chancy. It is, it's animal byproducts that attract other animals. So. That would be my, so. She asked whether eggshells were um, would attract animals. Yes, in the green. Ornamental grasses are native, or are there some that are native and some that are native lesser? Exactly. No, you have it. Some are ornamental, and in fact, we had a slide that showed the um, the how deep the roots go. Penistem, the fountain grass that we use a lot of because it's very pretty, just grows as slow. So some are native, some are not native. So there are some that are, grow that spread, and there are some that are bunch grasses. You just have to um, you just have to be think about which one you're buying, and you know once again where you're putting them and, and where they're going to be most appropriate. Does that answer? Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So this fellow says with eggshells, if you wash them and dry them, lay them out, that they can be crushed by hand pretty readily. That's good. That's a good idea. Yes, sir. Most towns have a foot and take or a tag sale. You get a blender for like trees. Yeah, it, it makes it more accessible to the plants, right? To have it all ground down. Yeah. I, so this fellow is saying that you can get a blender at the tag sale or you know at the thrift shop um, because it, you will. You'll you'll toast your. Uh, I I used a Vitamix. Not so smart. Um, uh, thank you for that suggestion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So he's saying dedicate it just to compost. Don't be trying to use it for other things afterward as well. It's it's very it's a strong scent. Yes, sir. Uh huh. And they also use organic soil. Mm -hmm. So this um, person had a garden last year, used organic plant, bought organic plants, bought organic fertilizer. You know, on the surface, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. The catch is whose version of organic, right? You know, um, organic, when they initially created that term in the federal government, it was a lot more lax than many of us would have liked. So um, there's, there's no actual way to know exactly. It's certainly you have a better chance than buying not organic. Yeah, so fertilizing vegetable plants. I tend to try to make the soil as healthy as I can. Um, but like I say, I'm not the person to talk to about intensive vegetable gardening. Um, it would be pretty tempting to use organic fertilizer because we're asked. So in that case, we're not asking our soil to create what it's been evolved to create. We're asking it to create something completely different that it didn't evolve with that is concentrated and, um, and abundant. And so we're asking much more of that soil than what our soil is made for. So I would say you have to amend it. Yes. I have uh, two questions. First, uh, about the milkweed. I've heard that milkweed is bad for dogs. Is that true? Or like it's safe to have it with dogs? You know, we have had milkweed in our yards with dogs for abs over ever, always. Um, many of the cases of toxicity with plants and animals have to do with the amount. I know when I was working with high school students, we were looking at it takes like pounds of a plant in the animal at the same time to actually have an effect. So I haven't noticed that. It could be that it does exist, um, but I haven't experienced that. But the question is, what resource do we use for researching native plants? Wow. Oh boy, I can't um, there are, you know, there are so many fabulous books coming on the market right now by people who are doing this. 
Um, and, and if you like books, you know, opening that up and going from page to page, that's a fabulous way. Um, but the internet is pretty fabulous too, as long as you're cross-checking yourself, going to native plant providers who are within our ecotype, really, I think, and, and our scientists in the room would agree, is the, you're gonna get the biggest bang for your buck benefiting your ecosystem the most by going to a nursery that grows from seed, only our ecotypes. Um, and then, do they have the plant or not? If they have the plant, then you use it. If not, then, then you know that that plant is going to have lesser benefits and you know, depending upon the plant and the circumstances to whatever extent. Um, but the easiest way, if you're new at it, would be to go to one of those nurseries and see what they're offering and then use that as your palate. Because when you don't, you're asking for more work. When you put a plant in the ground that isn't meant to be there, then you get to take care of it more. You get to water it more. You get to fertilize it more because it's not meant to grow there. You know, it's not, it's something I didn't put in, in the presentation, but all of a sudden it struck me. You're fighting an uphill battle. There's a phrase somewhere that says a, a prairie is just an un, uh, a yet to grow forest in the Northeast because that's what we have. We have forests. So if you don't, if you aren't growing a forest, you're in for some work right? Because everything in nature wants to put that forest back in there. Growing native plants is a little bit less than growing a lawn. You're really fighting, pushing an uphill battle. Sisyphus, the ball up the hill. So, yes. Simple question, but I don't know the definition of an ecotype. Can you help me with that? So, I'm not sure I'm going to give you a great definition, yeah. but it's basically just by ecotype, I think Michelle and other people who are working with native plants just say, there are different genetic forms of a species. Right. So in this region, there are certain ecotypes that like if you get plants from the Midwest, it's not going to be genetically the same as what it would be here. So the people who are really particular about this try to say, well, try to get your New Hampshire plants from New Hampshire or where we are, Vermont, Massachusetts, so that you're more likely to have the right genetic and that's why you recommend the seed first. Well, in addition to so the question was, what is um, what does ecotype mean? I'm going to attempt to paraphrase you that ecotype is the genetic mix that is specific to a point and place in that's part of a plant. However, the 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 correlation to this growing plants by seed, growing native plants by seed, is the genetic diversity allows for change, right? Plants everything in nature changes over time. Most of the, uh, pollinate, the pollinator plants or perennials that you grow, that you buy at the regular places are cloned plants. It's much easier, it's much quicker to take a cutting. And from that cutting, you can make 500 plants, but they're all exactly genetically alike. So there's no differentiation and there's no continuing to evolve. And if something happens to like that particular mix, then it's all gone. So it's a little bit of two different issues. Yes? Is that why when you grow um, plants like with tomatoes and stuff uh, that aren't really meant to be there and then something comes in that already likes them and already knows them? So, so the question is, I think the question is, um, I've been talking a lot about plants that are meant to grow somewhere and you try to grow tomatoes. Um, is that why somebody comes in? Is that why lots of creatures come in and try to, to take advantage of it? It's certainly, it certainly suggests and is true that, as I mentioned, when you're trying to grow something that isn't meant to grow in that place, it's gonna be more work, period. And, native plants are have more defenses against a lot of those critters, right? A non-native plant is going to be more susceptible to not only the things that like it because it's not as happy as it would be in the place where it's really supposed to grow, as well as the critters that already live there. So I think so, I think so. Does that answer your question? Okay, uh, any question? Yes, okay. Uh, so I'm going to say, if you want to leave, please feel free. I, I think we've, I don't know what our time is, but um, feel free. 
Um, someone says, my parents live in a creepy subdivision of Pennsylvania and the Homeowners Association has rules about what their yard can and cannot have. Any advice for those living in such places, I imagine they exist to look in country. They do. Homeowners associations are, um, you know, they're tasked with what the general public has decided they accept, right? It's the homeowners that make those rules. Um, and this is happening all over the nation, right? This fellow that we saw that prairie in the front yard, he has, he gets tickets all the time. He's in a, in a association. Um, so, you know, it depends on <laughs> how brave you're feeling. You can go plant it. Uh, there are people who have been fighting their local municipality for decades. They take the ticket because this is what they want to do. In time, in many of those places, the rules have shifted. Um, but it's really a personal choice. If you live in that place and you've decided, you know, I, I need to play by the rules, that's why we have them, um, you have that ability to go back and, and get pots and plant some of your natives there. In cities, they're literally finding that there's an increase in Paul, uh, how can they do that? I don't know how they do that, but they're basically saying that even people who live in cities can have pots on their on their balconies with native plants and find that pollinators will find those plants, right? So anything is going to make do, and if you really want to play by the rules, then put it in pots. You and most homeowners associations have this particular area where you're allowed to do things, and the rest where you're not. So go great guns in the whatever square footage immediately adjacent to the walls of your foundation, to your foundation walls, and then, you know, deal with it from there. Oh, there's a second. Um, they say also I live in Vermont, there are an invasive worm has taken hold. Oh, oh Do I have these in keen? If so, do you have any advice for ridding the property of them and or managing their numbers? Wow, dumping worm. Oh my goodness. Um, this is an invasive. Um, and, and it is a game changer. Uh, I did not put it in here. Um, it upsets me um, because all of our uh, research institutions, at least agriculture, are trying to figure out a jumping worm is, is shinier. It has a white band on it and it comes through getting a plant from one place to the other, it comes through the soil. Um, no, all earthworms are non-native, right? But regular earthworms that we've been living with for some time help us break down our leaves and things and create soil from it through their castings. You hear of worm castings as a fabulous fertilizer, right? Jumping worms are different. They fly through soil. They can depauperate an entire forest of its leaves. Um, just gobbling them down. And unfortunately, what they leave behind is this very grainy textured, almost like coffee grounds texture of soil. And we don't know what to do about them. Where I come from in Madison, Wisconsin, there are actually plant swapping groups that are no jumping worms and jumping worms, right? I have them in my gardens. They are here in New Hampshire. They're in Vermont. They are in the Midwest. I don't know exactly what their reach is. What I am doing, um, because the birds don't like them, their skin is has a, a thicker texture. And I, you know, I thought, okay, I'll toss them out in the street. The birds will eat them, right? Food, mm -mm, the birds don't like them. Nobody eats them. So um, what I did last year was I cut them in half. That was pleasant. Um, but I'm still not quite sure I didn't create double. And what is being suggested now by the people who are looking at this is to, I literally went and got all these cardboard boxes, little squares to put a yogurt container in with rubbing alcohol or straight vinegar that somehow I'm gonna have to carry around with me to drop that baby in there every time I see it. You can also put them in a plastic bag, a black plastic bag, and then leave it out in the sun um, you know, and they'll get fried, but boy, just leaving them in a bucket, they live a long time. Hmm. It's not pleasant. So jumping worms, uh, there are people who have just given up because of jumping worms, right? And I, I feel it's that much more important to get that leaf mulch on those gardens because regular fertilizers are not going to help that soil combat this. Um, so, um, my, my way of treating this is to have that little yogurt container with rubbing alcohol, or I'm probably going to use vinegar next to me as I'm going along. 
Um, and, to, and to put as much of that leaf mulch in the places where it needs to go. You know, I, I, this is not, I have a presentation called Leave the Leaves. And, and the other thing for taking care of lawns with leaves is to mow those first leaves into your lawn because it actually adds those nutrients. Any way that you can add those nutrients back into the soil is gonna help the soil. Was that the last one there? Okay, so we had, I think, three questions here. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> There's a pleasant thought, right? Oh, the whole thing of dead slimy worms and vinegar. I haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> That's probably what I would be tempted to do is flush it down the toilet. Um, yeah, I take in the dog turds and yeah. Um, so yeah, so if your family doesn't allow you to flush it down the toilet, you know, I would probably put it in the refuse, you know, because you, you, that concentration of um, vinegar is not necessary, it's not good for the compost bin, right? Um, so I'd probably put it in a bag and put it in the garbage until somebody tells me different. Has anybody heard anything different? I hear you. And I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not. So... Good job, daughter. Um, Army, I have not heard that term. I have not heard that as a common term. They call them jumping worms because when you touch them, most of the time they go and they go a little bit nuts. Whereas a regular worm just kind of sits there, right? Um, sometimes when you touch them, they don't do anything. And you're like, wait, what? But sure enough, you touch them again and, and they go nuts. So I haven't heard army worms. Somebody asked if army, army worms was another term for them. Yeah, I, I haven't heard it. It's possible. It's certainly possible. Wow, that's intense. It's a different thing. Is it a different thing? Okay. She's Googling it here. <laughs> oh, the magic of the internet. Check that twice just to make sure. Yes, question. You know, you got a fire going, sure. But if you throw them into the fire pit and the fire pit has the, you know, last little bits of wood and whatever, they're going to go into the soil probably before you get around to making that next fire. So they, oh, they're dead. How are you killing them to make? Oh, the vinegar in a fire pit. That's a good idea. It might smell for a minute, but that's a great idea. Yeah, dead, dead jumping worms mixed in vinegar. Fire starter. Okay, there's a new industry. Make it into a thing. Anything else? I've kept you for a long time, I'm sure. I'm sure it's run over. So please consider coming to a live workshop. <laughs> Thank you. And that's a great way to do it, is to just take a walk through and talk about what your ideas are and hear what some of the possibilities are. Um, and so I have a little website. Are you, are you on the internet at all? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, see, some people aren't.